Welcome back to the Age of Humans and thanks for tuning in for another episode of Cultural Curiosity 101. As you might already know, this season we explore the world of languages and communication. We had a blast so far and there is yet a lot more to come. If you don't already, follow us on Instagram at Age of Humans. This is the fourth out of six episodes. And after we have touched on how languages and thought are related, the communication across cultures and lingua francas in the last episode, today we are covering the hows and whats regarding things you say. Put simply, communication in human relationships. Put more simply, how people differ in terms of the way they communicate. Today you should find out some reasons behind why we talk differently, how we do it, and what can we do to have an efficient communication between us. I really hope you share at least 50% of the excitement that I've got, and without any more rambling, let's get into it. Let's backtrack a bit to the 1700s when the world was a bit different than it is today. There were wars on every continent but Australia, where James Cook explores and maps it, as well as the New Zealand. European colonization across the world was expanding even further as slave and human trafficking reached a global scale. Napoleon was on the verge of becoming the French emperor, later expanding France to its larger span ever. Finally, worth mentioning is how revolutions began to challenge those in power. The period is described as the century of lights or the century of reason, probably because philosophers dreamt of a brighter future and the world was going through major changes. The Enlightenment period played a great cultural factor in the way we perceive the world, as well as in the use of communication, especially in the Western world. So one may think that the 18th century was a time when we stopped thinking about the earth as being flat or that a woman's profession as a natural healer was actually black, white or purple magic. Therefore, we should light a fire and burn them on a pyre. Well, the first one is still true. However, in my lovely home country, Romania, the way we enlightened ourselves was to implement a tax for wizardry. And if that was not enough, the predictions that didn't come true equated to jail time for those who foresaw them. Anyways, the point here is that many things have changed since the Enlightenment period. And one aspect that has suffered a complex change of perspective and is important for our talk today is marriage. Back in the 18th century, marriage, which was only between a husband and a wife, was to last till death do us part and was encouraged from an early age. This was to do with a great number of factors and maybe one worth mentioning is regarding women's rights. However, technological advancements as well as a more equal society in the Western cultures changed our perspective. Put simply, the facts are as follows, and bear with me. Since the Second World War, there are many countries in which fewer and fewer are getting married. This does not depend on the wealth or the culture, as for example in China and Russia, marriages are more common today than decades ago. Secondly, people in most countries are marrying later in life. As well as this, the average age of women getting married is increasing. In Sweden, for example, the average age is 33 and a half years old. But we will talk more about Sweden later. The Netherlands were the first country to legally recognize same-sex marriage in 2000. And since then, over 30 countries followed. And now, where I wanted to get to, divorce. In many countries, divorce rates are higher and have doubled since the mid-20th century. But in others, marriages are lasting longer than ever. There are obviously, as said before, plenty of factors influencing these decisions, but information was harder to obtain in the past and people valued it more, which led to the reluctance of sharing information. That means people talked less openly, less efficiently, therefore they put less effort into trying to understand the person. 
This led to relationships based more on respect or fear than mutual understanding. We will not argue today if having a long marriage is good or bad, but instead we want to check out how communication is playing its role in the broader picture, analyzing what leads to healthy interpersonal communication. In episode 1, we analyzed how thoughts could potentially be influencing languages. In episode 2, we tried to expand this idea to understand how it is beneficial to use your communication skills around the world. And then in episode 3, we learned how people can use lingua francas to communicate with others who do not know their mother tongue. Today, we will talk about efficient communication in relationships, factors that influence different styles of communication, and the tools we have at hand to improve our communication. It will be about problems that you face in everyday life, in any kind of relationship, whether about your partner, kid, parent, brother, business partner, or even the relationship between a footballer and his referee. Mostly, this talk will be based on factors that influence styles of communication and tips. Oh, yeah, how could I forget? We have a class A expert today too. He is a global speaker from Sweden, author in leadership and workplace communication, particularly passionate about human communication. And for over 25 years, he has worked on strategies that help people to get along. His name is Antoni Lasinai, and I want to say a big thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. We produced this interview during the pandemic while Anthony was in Stockholm, I was in Cardiff, and Ludas was in a remote lodge in the middle of Lithuania, probably enjoying a warm sauna soon after the interview. Uh, anyways, at times the sound quality might not be at its best, so bear with us. To begin with, we will first analyze a bit the different styles people have in communicating based on personality, learning styles and feelings, and how much we should trust them. I think we all have different communication styles, every one of us, depending on, you know, what, how rich is our vocabulary, what, what kind of personality do we have. All sorts of things come into play when it's time to, to communicate, so for sure. We have all those uh, personality tests you can do, you know, like DISC and are you blue or green or, and all of that. And, and some people think that this is uh, just bogus and some people say, you know, this is science. And I say it's useful. So why not use it as that? It's, it's a useful tool. It's of course wrong in many levels, but it's also, it kind of rings the true sometimes as well. So it's good to have that in the back of your head if you want to, but you don't have to over kind of, overplay it but for sure we have different communication styles i'm guessing some of you some of us are really patient and thoughtful and, and speak slowly and really try to find every word in, in its essence and then some people are like you know, impatient and, and just think from the top of their head and they just talk fast blah, 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 like i'm doing uh, this, this way so you have all those kind of different uh, styles for sure well, I've been looking into what's called NLP, like Neuro Linguistic Programming, where you talk a lot about that type of learning styles. Are you visual, auditive? Is it about the feelings or what is it? And, and from, a, from a science perspective, this has not been proven. That, that you can say that you, have, you should always go for the auditive with that person because they lean their heads to the right or left. So, so it does, it's not proven that you can do that, but you can have that as, a, again, like a model I have, I have a good friend who he says that all models are wrong, but some models are useful. So, so this is one of those models you can use to color your language in a good way. So you could add visual elements and also, you know, how, how it sounds, how it feels and so on. So you can kind of create the richness of, of your language when you talk to people for sure. But from a learning perspective, I'm not so sure that this is the way to go. But what is the right way of approaching these different styles and people? So we asked Anthony, what technique does he use? When I'm really good at it, I, I, I use a lot of empathy. I'm, I'm curious. I'm trying to figure out how they work. What's their tonality? What, what's the words? Uh, what are the words they use? Um, uh, what kind of tempo do they have when they speak? And I'm trying to match that somehow. Uh, 
if I do that deliberately, I mean, normally I don't do it deliberately. I just go with the flow. But sometimes I'm kind of very deliberate in, in finding out, being very curious about that person and then try to adapt myself so, so that we are kind of in tune with each other. And it's not, it's not really about manipulation. It could be about manipulation, but it could also be a, a sign of respect. I want to I wanna, you know, understand you and I want to be understood. And how can I be that uh, to the best of my uh, capabilities? You know, if I talk to a four-year-old, perhaps I shouldn't use words like efficiency or productivity or things like that just to make it really clear on what I mean. Um, so, so trying to just match another person and, and their style is, is, is a good way to, to get, kind of get the good chemistry going. So coming back to the curiosity that we mentioned countless times in the age of humans, how important is that in interpersonal communication? I mean, be curious, ask questions, but not only ask questions just because you want to tick in the box. You want to ask them and, and be very attentive and, and, and present in the moment and observing it and, and kind of figure out who that person is. If you do that, then you're in good shape because then you can adapt your way, your style, your energy, your clarity and so on. If you don't, then... Uh, you go about doing your thing and, and hopefully they like you as my, um, uh, you know, well enough that you can get along anyway. But, but if you really want to, if you really want to reach someone, you need to understand where they are and it goes for any relationship really. But doesn't too much curiosity imply that you might ask uncomfortable questions? I guess there is a limit and throughout history, people have been extremely careful with respect and formality as those shape differently based on culture and language. Nowadays, English, the most spoken language in the world, does not differentiate formal and informal pronouns. And for a non-native English speaker, you sometimes have second thoughts when you address an elderly person or somebody with a higher status than yours. Did I show enough respect and formality? Well, let's see what Anthony has to say about that. Well, when it comes to formality, I'm not very formal, so I can't really say, not my style. I'm, I'm trying to be buddies with most people. Um, but yeah, respect for me is, is one of those words where that can mean a lot of things. Uh, it could be submissive, uh, kind of low status type of, of feeling, and you are this high status, and I have to respect you. That's not really what I'm after here. I'm, I'm after like, respect for me in this sense is that I am... You know, I'm interested in you. That that's for me is respect. I'm 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 really trying to figure out you, help you know, understand you. And this is, by the way, basically impossible. I mean, I'm just right now studying this course in the university like an extra thing because I'm curious. So, so I'm studying this thing called consciousness and the brain. And I can tell you, nothing has been simpler after that. It's just more complicated. And one of the things that that kind of to put it into perspective, says uh, the statement is that you cannot ever, ever understand another person. You can get close, but you can never be that person. I can never say how it is to be you, Stefan. I cannot do that because I'm not you. I can, I can be, you know, I can get close. I can, I can use my own emotions and my empathy and my, my compassion to get close, but I can never be exactly you. There's only one you, and that's you. And the same goes for you, Lodas. It's, it's just how it works. But if I have that respect, and if I understand that I can never be, be so I, I cannot be you, I can still have the respect to try to understand you, as, you know, to the best of my capability. And that's for me, is where respect comes in. And now we finally get to Sweden. Being buddies with everybody is something nice and all. At the end of the day, the Scandinavian country is an example for the social reforms in the past decades, leading to it being one of the most, if not the most egalitarian country in the world. So what about that as a bias? Is it extreme? And what should we really be aware of? I have a huge bias because in Sweden, in the, I think it was in the 60s, um, the whole thing, thing about talking um, like in third person sometimes uh, and, and trying to be very um, formal in the language was removed. So we all said you up and down, like, like in hierarchy, you meaning 
uh, not like your highness, it's like you as a person. I can, I can say your first name instead of your last name or uh, things like that. We, that happened before I was born and that's kind of the society that I grew up in. So for sure I am biased, definitely. Um, it's the same with religion. I mean, Sweden is, is uh, the least religious country in the world. And for us, this is normal. This is the normality. It's not normal. We are extreme when it comes to the rest of the world. When it, if you look at religion, for instance. So um, we all, I think everyone goes around thinking that we are the norm. We are the standard. No, we're not. <laughs> we just have to realize that we have all those cultural differences and also personal preferences. So when I say I'm not very formal, it doesn't mean that I'm rude. I don't want to be rude to anyone, but I don't, I don't want to be rude to the cleaner at the hotel uh, as, as well. I mean, if you have a hotel, I mean, if you have the hotel director, I want to be nice to that hotel director, but I also want to be nice to the cleaner at that hotel. So that's what I mean that I'm not really formal from that perspective. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be nice at least to, to most people. I, I'm not, I'm not saying that I am. Sometimes I fail completely, being impatient or intolerant or something, or having a you know a, a, like like a bad service somewhere. And I'm one of those people who who kind of high, highly sensitive to this because this is my profession to look at communication from a workplace perspective. So I can I can I can just tell them this wasn't very nice of you, was it? You know, and that's that's very blunt of me sometimes. So I'm I'm not in any shape or form perfect. I just spend most of my waking hours thinking about this and also speaking about this. So, so perhaps I, I, I spend more time than most on communication, so to say. Quoting Anthony, this wasn't very nice of you, was it? End of quote. Is not particularly very blunt depending on the country you come from. We find that fairly polite in Eastern Europe, but that is about culture and you should check episode 2 for more details about how culture and communication are linked. Now we will get a bit more serious about the one-on-one -on -one communication. Anthony mentioned psychology earlier as being listened to but not taken for granted. However, he did a lot of research over the 25 years in this field and found a few psychological factors that he calls superpowers in order to get along with people. All right, I've been looking into kind of communication keys or principles and so on for like 25 years or so. And finally, I mean, in, in my 12th book, I, I decided to put them all together in one book. In English, it's called Employee Engagement, and it's about 20 keys to communication. So there you have them. But you also have what I call three communicative superpowers in there, aggregated, you could say. And, and if you want to get along with people, if you want to build good relationships with people, I guess you need to, to be a good communicator. And that doesn't mean one-way communication, it's a two-way thing. And the ones I mentioned in the book that, that I believe are the ones, you know, the three communicative superpowers after all the studies I've done is energy, empathy, and clarity. Energy, empathy, clarity. Those are the three communicative superpowers. And Looking at them, at them, you have empathy. For, let's take empathy first, because I actually believe that that's the most important one. If you have empathy, you are curious, you are uh, interested in other people, you try to understand them, and then you can kind of go into your energy level and your clarity, depending on who you have in front of you. Um, so that's, that's uh, empathy, being interested. I mean, really, if you look at it, how many people are really interested in you? I mean, if you, if, you, if you start looking at it, not very many people are mostly interested in themselves. <laughs> you know, that's how it works. So if you can be the one giving that gift, your time and your presence and your attention to someone, that's a gift. That's what, what empathy is about. So if you want to get along with people and build relationship, be curious. And the other two are more about how you project your communication outwards instead uh, so if you pair them up, like high energy with high clarity, those are the leaders who create engagements within their audiences or their, their, their peers or their, their co-workers and their teams. Um, if you have low energy, it doesn't really matter how clear you are. You will become boring anyway. If you have high energy but no, um, no clarity, then you're a clown. So you have to have that balance of all of those three what I call superpowers. It's just my name for it. If you have that, you're a really good communicator. And I believe that 
most of us have all of them in some way or form, but we probably lack, you know, a decent level on at least one of them, which means that I can be very direct, but I lack empathy. And then I become pushy and arrogant and dominant and mm, not really the one that you want to hang out with. Somebody you can be scared of, perhaps if they are your superior, for instance, but not the one you want to bring to your barbecue party, for instance. So energy is, for me, mostly observed in your body language and in your voice. If you have a very monotonous voice and no body language, then you project low energy. And energy is like a, a magnet almost. It can always like how much do you radiate? How much do you draw back to you? It's like going into this, you know, let's say that we, we have a vacation. <laughs> now we're into the pandemic, so we don't have any vacation. But let's say that we have, you know, this, somebody will listen to this after the pandemic or once we got the shot or something like that. So you go into the street and a restaurant, you know, like with many restaurants. And some of the restaurants are kind of packed with people, your music, the laughter, and then some of the restaurants are completely empty. Which one would you go to if you could? I ask these questions quite a lot, and everyone says, of course, almost everyone says, I want to go to the, to the restaurant where other people are. That's where the action is. That's the energy. And I say, I agree, because if I go to the, to the empty restaurant, it will probably be boring and you will probably get food poisoned, by the way. So that's what's going to happen. You want to be where the action is, where the energy is, where the positive energy is, because that's like a magnet. So if you have a, a body language that, and a voice that make people believe that you believe, then they can believe themselves. Why should they believe in you if you don't project that passion or, or enthusiasm or, or whatever it is yourself? And I mean, I, again, I live in the Nordic countries where we have a limited body language and <laughs> a pretty limited range when it comes to voice as well. So, so I'm perhaps, again, biased when it comes from that, from that perspective. It's not like a, the biggest problem in, in some of the Mediterranean countries where I'm actually from. You know, if you look at my birth, and my DNA and so on. Um, but in the Nordic countries, this is a problem. We, have, we, we project low energy, even though we, we might be very passionate about things. We still have a limited body language. We don't use our arms much you know, enough and we don't use the right emphasis and, and the right tonality. And it just doesn't come across as very engaging. You know, you can, go, you can, you can talk about like with broad, broad paintbrushes about uh, culture, like regional culture and so on. And then you can see that the way no, more, you, the more north you go, the more low contextual they are and, and so on. And, and, and perhaps limited in the body language. And yes, that could be a problem internally in Sweden, but also, you know, if you go to other countries. Um, but, you know, Again, it comes back to the level of empathy and so on. And, and it's really hard to over, you know, exaggerate it if, you're, if you live in the Nordic countries, because, you know, a, a gesture that is wide feel really, feels really strange to the to people I train in this, for instance, if we talk about presentation skills training, but it looks good. So I'm trying to, you know, make them understand that it looks good. It's for the audience. It's not for you. It's for the audience. On the other hand, when I, for instance, had a Brazilian that I uh, had uh, coached in, in presentation skills, this was when, when we could meet physically, then, then sh she was all over the place. She was a Brazilian dancer. You know, if, if you just can imagine somebody with a body language that is overflowing so, so much that I couldn't hear the word that she said. So for her, I had to say, you know, try this, stand still, don't move your feet anywhere and say what you want to say. And she stood there like for five, 10 seconds. And then finally she said, I can't do it you know, because she needed her body in order to get the words across. But for her, it was actually to limit a bit your, her body language because the energy was so high in her, in her body language that I couldn't hear what she said. So, so you had to have that balance again between energy and clarity. So she lacked clarity, not only in the words, but also in the whole movements because Again, you need functional gestures if you, want to, if you want to work with your body language, for instance. Let's say that you're talking about increasing something, performance or quality, 15 to 30%. Now, if you raise your hand and show 15 to 30%, like you raise your hand while you do it, then it's a functional gesture. It will strengthen your message. It will make you more believable. And once again, culture comes into the mix. 
And it should not be surprising. I would have loved to just sit there and see this strange energy mix between the Brazilian and the Swede being displayed. But today we are not making the classic joke about when they are in a bar. No, in this instance I would join the joke and stay there in the bar watching and learning how they try to understand each other. The thing is, Anthony would definitely know the truths about communication. And you can check his TEDx about that, link in the episode description. We will not cover all of those truths in detail as you can always access the link. However, I will quickly summarize the six truths. One, you cannot not communicate. Two, you cannot say exactly what you mean. Three, you make people feel what you want them to feel. Four, first impressions last. Five, be interested instead of interesting. And six, your body speaks louder than words. So, coming back to our podcast, we asked Anthony if they will ever change. They are almost eternal. Those, the ones that are brought up there are the big ones, the, the kind of universal generic ones. Uh, they will not change, I think, ever. Uh, so, so yes, they are up to date. And actually the whole TEDx that I talked about was, was like, a, like a, a, me worshipping analog communication in this digital world that we're in. And all I do nowadays or digital communication, you know, keynotes or train people in digital presentations or digital meetings or, or how to lead people remotely. Everything about, is about digital communication. But I mean, the principles are still there, the ones that I talk about. And then it's a matter of adapting it to, to a digital format. We should add here that according to research and to Anthony, we all changed our styles of communication through time and evolution. So even though these truths are always there, the means of communication have changed drastically since the 1700s and enlightenment. Now it is all about digital communication. Digital communication is much harder and unnatural for us. We are you know, hard-coded DNA-wise to sit around a campfire and, and getting all that richness of the analog physical communication. You can feel almost the temperature shifting. Somebody raises an eyebrow and it means something. In this world, uh, even if we have video, we really don't have eye contact. I mean, if I look into a camera, I can't see you. If I look down to the screen, it, you don't feel that I have eye contact. So it, it, it's just a lesser means of communication. It's not easier in any way. So that's one of the reasons you have to kind of find ways to adapt. There are great advancements, but, but it's nowhere near as rich as when we meet face to face. This whole meeting that we have today, you and I, or all of us three, are done in three different locations. And if we would have been in the same room, we would have a different vibe. I mean, this is awesome. We can do this. We can sit here like we do now and have this conversation. It's, it's amazing. I mean, I was, I was born pre, pre-digital stuff almost. I mean, I got my first email address when I was 25 or something like that. I got my first phone when I was 25 or something. So I've been through that transition and, and, and I don't want to go back to that time. But I'm not saying that it's better. This, this is not better in itself. It's better because it's, you know, what we have and, and it's good enough. And good enough is many times the best because that means that we, we use all the resources we can in the best way we can. But is there anything to be concerned about in these technological advancements? For instance, um, let's talk about the voice. It will never come across as rich uh, in this format because the, the techies have compressed the sound to what can be called the conscious frequencies, uh, around 3000 hertz or something like that. Uh, but we actually, 
when we speak normally, we have a range from 300, or we can actually listen to a range from 300 to 30,000 hertz. And, and the emotions are mostly in the upper and lower frequencies. And those are cut away, most of it, not, not all, but some, some of it are cut away because of bandwidth reasons. So that means that, again, it's harder for you to interpret my intentions, which means that it's harder for you to also interpret my emotions. And this makes you unsecure, unsure. What is it really meaning here? You know, when we have video, it helps us a bit because then we can at least look at someone and see if they're smiling when they say it or not. Email is the worst. You know, it's like just just above smoke signals when it comes to you know communication. Uh, I, I say that the human communication analog is the best, and then comes nothing, and then after a while comes video, and then nothing, 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 and then phone, and then way at the bottom you have. You have uh, emails and, and uh, chat and so on. The, the benefit with email is not clarity. It's traceability of misunderstandings. That's what, what the great benefit is of, of, a, of an email. Still, I email, uh, I don't call people or, or video chat with everyone. I mean, lots of emails you know, run through my fingers uh, all the time. So it's, it's just an easy way of doing it. And then it's not very efficient all the time. Another thing is that when we have a video meeting, for instance, uh, we are, you know, one part of our brain is always trying to figure out where everyone else is compared to you. This is a survival thing. Are you three meters away? Are you half a meter away? You know, the closer you are, the more I have to trust you. Otherwise, I want you, you know, far away. But we cannot detect that on a two-dimensional screen. It's, it's kind of, it's virtually impossible, but our brain doesn't understand that. So it's working over time to just figure out where, where we are. And that's why, that's, this is one of the key reasons why you get so tired after a video meeting. And then my, some people say, oh, well, then we should go back to phone meetings. No, we should n- not do that unless it's a one-on-one meeting. That, that's fine. That could be a phone meeting because then we actually detect emotions better than we do in a video sometimes. So, so but as, as soon as there are many people, video is, of course, uh, advantage, uh, much, much better than, than a phone meeting where you can't see anyone and people start to, even, even now, and this, this is actually a video recording, but, but then I guess the, the pod will be the audio version of it. Still, we have managed to interrupt each other at the wrong time and, and, and saying, I'm sorry, it's your turn and all that because, because we don't really know who's supposed to talk. But that can also happen, of course, in an analog physical space as well. What you've now covered is what kind of problems we run into when we're trying to communicate in this digital age using those the digital technology um because we are used to analog so much but do you think that people now having well we are slowly transitioning uh with an with the advance of technology into communicating more and more through this medium so do you think actually there's some uh lasting influences of that transition into the way we actually communicate in analog well, uh, well, first of all, I think if you look forward when it comes to you know, what, what will happen in the future with, with the digital communication, I think it will be more and more like analog communication with virtual reality and augmented reality, and we will feel like we're in the same room and so on. So it will be better as we go along. And this is just, we just took a quantum leap from Skype to this, which is, you know, the new systems where we are now, but they are still not good enough. So we're going to look into, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality, and all those things, holograms, perhaps we'll see. But if it has had an effect on analog communication, that's what you asked me. Hmm. All right, the the short answer is I'm not sure. Uh, but I have I have read people uh, read read books about you know from from scientists and so on, social scientists who says that the biggest risk is for uh, younger people who did not practice analog communication enough. So they spend so much time on the digital communication that they don't really know how to act in an analog world anymore. Uh, It it could differ, of course, from person to person here as well. I mean, I have two sons, both of them spend tons of time on, on, on times on, 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 in front of the screen, but one is more of an introvert and the other one is more of an extrovert. And of course the extrovert uh, understands, you know, some codes that, that he figured out anyway compared to my introvert uh, guy. Both of them are super intelligent. I mean, of course, objectively speaking, they're my sons, but I mean, they're, they're so good. I, I love them both, but they're very different in their communication style. 
So I can't say that it is because of, of the, the medium, like that they spent too much time on a, in front of a screen. But this is what uh, some of the scientists are saying, that this is a, at least a, a risk that we should uh, acknowledge, that uh, the more time we spend on this, the less time we spend on analog communication, which means that we, we run a risk of empathy going down. And, and really look at all the trolls and all the haters online. They would never say things like that in front of you. But here it's like a go ahead, just say whatever you want and hate people unconditionally. I think it's, uh, it's a sign of people's uh, shift, you know, the shift in people's behaviors and therefore communication. Now, let's talk for a second about loneliness. Loneliness is a complex and usually unpleasant emotion which typically includes anxious feelings about a lack of connectedness or communality with others. As such, loneliness can be felt even when surrounded by other people. Loneliness is one of the most significant challenges facing Western society. Given COVID and the amount of time we spend on phones and social media, many of us encountered loneliness. But many studies say that feeling, building and expressing empathy towards others may reduce the feeling of loneliness. So we asked Anthony what he thinks about that. Loneliness is uh, lethal in some cases, actually. It's that, it's that dangerous. You have to, you know, every people who feel isolated and, and outside, they're not inside, they're outside of, of communities or context. They, uh, they really suffer. This is, uh, if that's how you feel, I feel for you because this is really tough, being isolated, being by yourself. Perhaps you live by yourself and now you're not allowed to talk to even, you meet even friends. It's, it's uh, if, you're, if, if people are listening to, to this while the pandemic is raging, raging, this is really bad. Of course, you can be lonely anyway. You can be isolated and lonely anyway. And what you see is that it, it's a decline of, of well, mental, mental health. It's really hard for people to be resilient and positive if they feel that it doesn't mean anything. They're by themselves. Nobody cares. I'm alone. I'm actually not only alone, I'm lonely. That's a difference here. You know, I'm alone quite a lot. I mean, I've been spending my time the last 15 years being on my own, uh, having my own company, having my office in my house. And then I'm out traveling the world, uh, talking to, you know, and then I meet a lot of people. But, but when I'm home, I'm, I'm alone, but I'm not lonely. The antidote to that is probably, you know, find ways to communicate with people you love. Uh, and then, of course, people in, in your business context as well find ways to communicate with them. That will at least decrease the loneliness. And also see, you know, like for instance, now we have a lot of home workers. People have been forced to work from home and they feel again, isolated, a bit disengaged. Uh, motivation goes down, performance goes down. And one of the things that we should probably focus on more than ever is the whole purpose of why we as a group, for instance, exist. How can, what are we doing to help the world? Let's say that you are employed somewhere. What is it that we bring to the table? Even if we work from, from different you know, remote, remote locations, what, what is our mission? Because if you have that mission, that purpose, you get, you know, you, you will be more, you have more perse perseverance. You will persevere more. You will work more. You will be more engaged, more motivated. If you are unemployed in a time of a pandemic where you're not supposed to meet anyone and you have few relatives, I don't have an answer for you more than find your crew, find your peers, find your people that you can connect with one way or another. Digital communication doesn't give you as much as analog communication, but it gives you something at least. And when you have a chance to just, you know, say hi to your neighbor or, you know, be around people again when you can, because that will, again, be better. But to be among a lot of people, but still be lonely, that's also tough. Like, let's say that you're in a party or something, and you feel that everyone else know, it, know one another, and you don't, and you're standing there by yourself. That's really hard as well. Can you find a way to get into a conversation with someone? Can you ask some questions and get some, some things going and, and be curious again about other people? The more curious you are about other people, the less you care about yourself, which means that you don't put focus on feeling sorry for yourself. Instead, you put focus on other people. You forget about yourself for a while. 
For the rest of the episode, we will touch on something a bit different. As we talked about many ways of making yourself understood and how the way you talk influences your relationships with others, now we will talk about misunderstandings and misunderstandings at the highest levels. In this instance of football, more precisely in Champions League, arguably the most important club competition in the world. Now, bear with me. Months ago, more exactly on the 8th of December 2020, an event came up that drew my attention. Maybe because I am Romanian, maybe because I follow football every now and then, but probably more because how interesting and heated the discussion got. I will not get into the details of the whole story because it's not relevant into this debate, but the facts are the following. It was a Champions League match between Paris Saint-Germain and Istanbul Basak Shehir. There were Romanian referees for the game. The game lasted for 15 minutes. Why? Well, there were many fouls happening on the pitch. The people on the bench of Istanbul BB were protesting after every foul. Now, the fourth referee, or the linesman, a fact that is still unclear even after listening to the recordings, told the main referee, who is the only one who can give yellow and red cards, that he should book someone on the Turkish team's bench. When the fourth referee, or the linesman, pointed to whom should be booked, he used the phrase, quote, a la negro, end of quote. The translation is the following. Ala means that, and negro means black as an adjective. So, put together, it obviously means that black guy or that black one. The event reached the whole world. People were divided between the ones calling the fourth ref a racist and those who were taking his defense. The teams left in solidarity the pitch and the game resumed from the 15th minute, but on the next day and with a different referee team. After this, UEFA, the European Forum and authority for these games, decided to start an investigation to determine what and why did it happen. Fast forward a couple of months later, and on the 11th of February, the case was judged. The conclusions are the following. He did not use any negative or derogatory terms, according to the linguistic report. This was checked in, quote, the most relevant Romanian to English dictionaries, end of quote, and it is not offensive. Moreover, the word negro, which is again an adjective that does not mean negro, is used by big anti-racist organizations to fight against racism. In the UEFA's file, it's stated that, quote, the words used cannot be accounted as discriminatory or racist. Therefore, no disciplinary action will be taken. End of quote. However, UEFA said in a statement on Monday, March the 8th, that the fourth referee has been suspended for, quote, inappropriate behavior during a UEFA match for which he was appointed and had been ordered to attend an educational program before the 30th of June 2021. End of quote. Now, coming back to the episode, the terms he used, given the level and the exposure he was referring at, could have and probably should have been avoided because of the scandal provoked. No doubt, he should have been aware. However, you see, culture might have been an influence. A possibility may be that Romania did not have colonies back in the 1700s or even later on. Furthermore, they did not take part in the African slave trade. I am saying African here because slavery happened on the territory of Romania in the 18th and 19th century, but the slaves were of Roma and Tatar ethnicity. Referring to someone as being black is not sensitive in Romania, but putting it into the bigger context of globalization, it should have been avoided. So we asked Anthony if it was a matter of culture, or maybe the referee did not have the necessary education for that level. I don't see that this, this, this is an education problem. It could be a cultural problem. It could be that this is the way we say in, in, in my country. That could, be, that could be one of the things that, that uh, you know, it, it could happen that it is like that. It could also be blunt racism because if he is, uh, if he is 
a racist and he said it like that then it's racist but it, but many times it has to ha- it has to do with what one of my friends called the subtitling what is the subtitle that he's really saying and and that depends a lot on the interpreter as well so again if i am in a bad mood and you say something i will interpret you negatively actually i will prefer to interpret you negatively um, if i'm not sure what you mean because this is the way for the human species to to survive i mean let's let's look at it 20000 years back if i go down to a if i'm if i'm if you and i are in two different tribes and i see you guys uh, by the water drinking some water and i go and i see you and i'm going down there say oh that's a, that's another tribe ah we can get along and i go there and you kill me mm-hmm. you know that's that's what could happen in that case or it's a lion and i say again we can get along no problem both of us can drink there's plenty of water here we have to be a bit suspicious that's what i'm saying that that's part of 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 our dna so if i don't know what you mean and i'm not in the best mood because because of some for some reason i will interpret you negatively and this could be one of those cases where where that person was uh, perhaps in a, in a you know in a, in a state of mind that wasn't optimal and when that happened and, and he heard that guy that referee saying that black guy he could take real offense to that or someone else like two weeks earlier said something like that with a really disgusting manner and that kind of colored his interpretation of this next guy saying the, that black guy so so that could be wrong in itself but then again what is the proper language and and that's you know there's no excuse when it comes to education here if you if you judge if you you're a referee to two teams different countries and you come from a third country on that elite level you should probably know what you're saying so so it doesn't take away responsibility from from the referee but the actual interpretation could could depend on so many other things to summarize here at the age of humans we are trying to see the bigger picture and raise awareness there are many factors that play their roles in communication and one should take them into consideration So today we talked about a few things and I would like to summarize them all to hopefully not be forgotten. Firstly, there are many ways we can improve our communication and to do that one should focus on developing their energy, empathy and clarity. Secondly, respect is important but we should treat people as individuals not based on their social background. Three, Technology broadens our possibilities to communicate and we should get the best of them but also not forget that we need analog communication. Furthermore, putting the effort to talk to people you love or building relationships with some who share your interests is crucial for your well-being. And finally, misunderstandings can happen at any level, but before getting angry, try to contextualize why the other person talks the way they do ask questions be curious and be aware you cannot fully understand other people anthony's work can be found on his social media look for anthony lasinai a n t o n i l a c i n a i for more check his website at anthonylasinai.com He wrote a few books about relationships especially at the workplace and he just released one about employee engagement. Well that was that's where I where I collected all those 20 communication insights um keys principles about workplace communication how you lead people how you get along with people how you uh create great customer care I mean it's all about work related things um lead people cooperate how to get good engagement with you know with people and, and build relationships so i figured out those you know i collected i searched and collected for for you know principles that i can use and 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 train people in as well so i can help them become better communicators and i found 20 and of course in those 20 you can drill down quite a lot for instance if you talk about body language which is one then the body speaks louder than words is what i call this one um then of course in that you can go into a hundred different gestures and what do they mean and 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 all of that so we can dig deep into them some of them but but 
that's just a way of structuring it. It's a really easy kind of easy way to to digest this yeah, and just get a good read. And, and uh, some some companies and some departments use this as like a twenty week program. They say, okay, let's let's take the first lesson here. Uh, what can we do with this? How can this apply to our business? What can we how can we work with it and so on? And then they go to the next one for the next week and so on. So that's, that's just one way of working with it. But most people just read it because they want to, you know, get my insights more or less. And, and perhaps something sticks and then they will do something better. And, and that's good because then we're all creating a nicer world, I think. On the note of creating a better world, we will wrap the episode up. I hope you have enjoyed. We will post some material related to this episode on Instagram in the coming week. So make sure to check that out at Age of Humans. Also, follow us if you want to be updated on other episode releases. Our artwork was created by an inspiring artist and friend, Mihaila Dimitrova, or simply Misha. You can find more of her work at Misha Artwork on Instagram. She sells the prints of her works on Etsy, and we recommend visiting her shop link in the episode description for some reasons spotify on a personal computer does not allow you to click on the links but in case you are listening from a mobile device go ahead and check her work out also special thanks to our friend josh monks who has created a good portion of our sound effects and music our intro piece was a tremendous task of fitting six musical epochs into one 15 second piece and did a wonderful job josh is a conductor and you can find more of his arrangements on his youtube channel at jupus that is j-u-p-u-s link in the episode description same issues with the spotify links apply for josh so you will find the links on a mobile device in two weeks time ludas will touch on dying languages and what do people do to revive them an exciting topic where you will encounter several languages that i am sure you might have never heard of stay tuned and be curious until soon